welcome to this, the second version of the IFMA webinar series based around COVID-19. The idea behind these webinars is to focus on some of the consequences of the pandemic and how we can deal with it on a daily basis and get the best out of the situation, one issue at a time. My name is Peter Ankerstjern. I'm the first vice chair of the IFMA board of directors. I'm members of, a member of the workplace evolutionary community and on a daily basis, I'm the Global FM and Employee Services Lead from, uh, for JLL. This is a follow-up of the webinar we hosted last week on the topic of working from home. Last week, we received an overwhelming interest in the seminar which took place on 1st of April, and a lot of people tried to get on the call, but we had a limitation on our system. And we do apologize for those who did not get access. Hopefully, you've got access today. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, able to hear this anyway. <laughs> uh, at the webinar, we received more than qu uh, 80 questions during the session, um, which we, of course, didn't have time to answer. And therefore, we decided to do this follow-up session. So as we continue with the theme, work, work from home, the new normal, how do we adjust to this new reality of remote working? We will, over the next 45 minutes, answer some of the many questions we received. If you did not attend last week's seminar, don't worry, you can still follow the discussion from here. And if you're interested, last week's session is available on the IFMA website. Just before I introduce the panel, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will limit the webinar to 45 minutes in total. You can ask questions again during the live sessions. Uh, please send us your questions via the chat function on the uh, right-hand side here on GoToMeeting. You'll all be muted for audio quality, and the webinar will be recorded and will be available for you by tomorrow. With this, I'll just quickly reintroduce the panel. First up, we have Lucy Janes, and Lucy is Managing Director and one of the founders of Lark Consulting, which could celebrate uh, its uh, 25th anniversary last week. Lucy has experience in advising organizations on all aspects of FM strategy delivery, and she's considered one of UK's foremost experts in the field. Lucy is a board member of IFMA UK and is previous deputy chair of IWFM. Next, we have Dr. Anita Kamuri. Anita is vice president and co-founder of Iometrics, a workplace services firm that helps organizations succeed with remote work practices and next generation workplace strategies. With a doctorate, in organizational psychology, Anissa is an expert in workplace survey, research, and analytics. And finally, we have Kate Lister. And Kate is a recognized thought leader uh, within the field and has written five books and dozens of white papers and articles on the topic of workplace, workforce, and remote working. Kate is president of Global Workplace Analytics, a research-based consulting firm that has been helping public and private sector employers understand and implement new ways of working for more than a decade. All our panelists today are active members of IFMA and Kate and Anita are part of the Workplace Evolutionaries leadership team and are currently working on WEE's Working From Home survey, which we launched last week. With the introductions in place, um, we have grouped the many questions we received in six categories, and you can see them on the screen now. They are workplace productivity and productivity in general, the facility management profession, technology, remote work, engagement, and work-life balance. And we will try um, to get through all of these uh, headlines uh, as, as we move on. So let's move to the first question uh, we received from last week. And this question goes to Kate and is from uh, Anshul Akraval. How do you manage the productivity of your employees? What are some of the ways to set boundaries, maintain schedules, and avoid employee burnout? It's a question a lot of people are asking these days. And I think, you know, now what, three, four weeks into this, uh, it's become pretty clear that you need the right tools uh, and you need to know how to use them. So in a, in a uh, typical, if we'd done this as a typical rollout of work from home, right now we'd be having sort of lunch and learns, um, you know, maybe uh, show people the tools, work through some of the questions that they have. Uh, certainly you could start doing those kinds of things virtually. Uh, but in terms of managing uh, expectations, um, you know, I think you need to think about as an employee managing up. You know, here's what I'm going to be working on today, uh, or you know, at the end of the week, here's what I'll be working on next week. Does that match your expectations? 
um, or you know, I ran into just just continual communication of of what's going on, uh, so that you know they're not sitting sitting there wondering if you're working. Um, and I think by now we've also probably talked enough about core hours. You know, having an understanding with your manager and with your colleagues that you're sort of generally available in this time. Everybody's available in this block of time. But I think it's wrong to sort of set expectations of we all have to work between these hours because one of the things about working flexibly one of the most important things is also being able to flex your time and so we have people will work at three in the morning but you just have to be clear that that doesn't mean you have to work at three in the morning so i think some of those things can can sort of help settle the some of the angst that's going on right now yeah. fine thanks um next question is uh, for anita and that's from uh, Mulatu Kebede. What tips do you have to manage information security, file management, and correspondence while working remotely? Okay, that one, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that you start with is, is the computer equipment that you're using. So what we're seeing is that a lot of people, you know, have laptops from, from their employer, um, but then there's a lot of people who really weren't set up to, to be mobile or remote, so they're at home using home equipment. So, so what you need to do might vary, you know, based on the equipment you're using. But I think that the, the first thing is, you know, hopefully you're, you're pretty paperless. You know, because if, if you're paperless, it, it, it opens up a whole raft of, you know, the online filing, you know, being able to put security protocols around those uh, documents, having password protection, all that kind of thing. Um, if not, you know, you you probably want at least a secure, you know, file cabinet or something where you could where you could put that sort of thing. Um, but but process is probably the number one thing that you know having encryption on on whatever devices you're using if you're ending up using a, a device that is shared you know amongst family members you know having you know the separate logins uh encryption password protection um where we use biometrics you know in terms of the face re recognition or fingerprints or you know whatever you know those types of technologies are that that really helps as well so I, um, another just basic thing of not staying logged in, like we have passwords that'll expire after so many minutes of not using, you know, something. So, I mean, we are in the, in the data business, you kind of get used to these kinds of things of really, you know, being very, you know, security conscious. So um, the, the key thing is really making it part of your process. And, and there's a lot of uh, security protocols you can set up through your operating systems that, kind of help manage this for you really so that you don't have to think about it you know that um, it, it's not something that you have to kind of layer in it, it it'll happen you know it'll log you out you know from an activity you just log back in but again these are all you know these all are additive in terms of you know giving you a couple extra layers of protection and in, in your just as a follow-up in your view how how are companies actually doing uh, in terms of these types of issues in today's world? Yeah, it's, you know, and that's the thing that it just, for the companies where you've got your, you know, where you've already had a laptop deployed, it's a little more seamless because, you know, you're, as long as you're logged in through, you know, those, those connections, a lot of times your updates are done for you, your, all the latest versions of your software are on there, you know, all, all that kind of thing is, is set up when you've been told, okay, you're going to work from home and, you know, have at it with whatever you have at home. It, there's just so much variability in terms of what people, you know, have and how they're set up, like how you're set up on a home system where you store photos is a really different animal than, you know, somewhere where you're, you know, accessing, you know, your work material. So you may need to, to start thinking about how do you layer that in on, on those kinds of systems. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have a question from Jeffrey uh, Lincoln. And that goes to Kate. What are some of the tools and processes companies? What are some of the tools and pro, uh, uh, processes companies need to do remote work, and can they easily be implemented? I think in terms of technologies, you have to be careful not to use technology for the sake of technology. You might hear that, oh gosh, another company is is using. I don't want to name names, but <laughs> so let's all switch over to that. Uh, at, at least for right now, 
I think you need to, to focus on what's known. Certainly you need something like we're using right now, a, a shared platform for uh, collaboration that includes, preferably that includes video. Um, you need the uh, access to your files or, or uh, uh, cloud storage. So something like Dropbox or Google Docs or Microsoft Teams, where you can actually be collaborating on the same document at the same time. Although I have to say, they're not perfect. And even this week, we've had incredible problems with version control, even among my colleagues who know what they're doing. So I also recommend have a backup. <laughs> Don't just entirely rely on that cloud. Try to collaborate in the cloud, but have a backup in case things get muddied up, uh, particularly if you're not used to using the tools. But don't introduce new tools right now. Don't 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 try to convert everybody over to something that's unknown. It's just going to add to the stress and the confusion. Um, and just keep it simple. You know, if you have to pick up the telephone. <laughs> mm -hmm. But Kate, I think some of the the small companies and some of the companies that not, had not been used to remote working before, um, isn't it your experience that they have just used whatever is available out there? So. Uh, in my experience, I've I've been using Skype, Zoom, WebEx, whatever is available, and that what my counterpart was using and what I could get access to in in a in an easy way. Um, so I don't know how how do you see that? Um, because I think that's the reality most companies are in, uh, especially not the big ones, but the small ones and the ones yeah. that haven't had this experience before. Yeah, uh, I think. Those that were using the free accounts uh, probably need to upgrade to the, the the paid accounts. I mean, they're not very expensive. You can get by on free for for quite a while. You know, some of them you've got to limit your calls to 40 minutes, which is not all not not a very mm -hmm. bad idea actually. Um, but you do want to uh, to have the tools that that you know allow you to have a real meeting. And it's true that you know you may be using GoToMeeting, and I may be very familiar with Zoom. So you get on the next meeting platform and you don't know how to share your video or share a document. Uh, take a deep breath. We're all learning here. Uh, try, I think, throughout your organization to adopt the same tool. Um, having just said, don't switch to new tools. I mean, I think a go to meeting platform or something like that is a lot different than trying to switch over to, say, um, Microsoft Teams uh, or Slack. Uh, those are really fundamental, all-encompassing mm -hmm. uh, tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's okay, at least for now, to sort of do the hodgepodge, um, but just be sure everybody's tr on the, uh, the the same platform and used to using the same tools. Right. Thanks. Okay. The next one is from Amit Lal. What skills or competencies do employees need to successfully work remote? what cross-functional collaboration is needed. And I think that would go to you, Anita. Okay, sure. And uh, I think that when we think about skills and competencies, we look back to, uh, we've done a lot of kind of suitability assessment. So what are those skills, competencies, you know, factors that really are predictive of success in, in working remotely? And I think one of the key ones that is part of the person is, is kind of organization self-discipline types of skills you know can you you know can you create structure when you're working in a very unstructured setting like like your home you know can you keep on schedule be reachable you know have have some of those you know just kind of you know work management kinds of uh, skills and competencies and um, so that's one element um, another one speaking to what you know Kate was just saying is is really learning collaboration tools whatever that tool is um, you know, you want to keep connected and it might be a matter of messaging, being available. Like the one thing that an all encompassing tool like a Teams or Slack might have is that, you know, you can see where your teammates are. Are they available? Are they online? You know, you get the status checks because one of the key elements here is you, know, you don't want to be out of sight, out of mind. I mean, that's always the fear, you know, with with remote work. And so what you want to do is is just you know let people know you're available you're either there to support them or you know you know you're you're there to, to be part of that team um, because i don't think this is going to go away altogether i think after after covid i think we're going to see you know a, a, a period of time where you know some of the people might come back 
but I think even long term, there's going to be, you know, maybe more work from home after than there was, you know, before. So I think these kinds of skills, you know, are going to be relevant going into the future. Um, another one would be communication skills. You know, what we talk about sometimes would would come across very differently in an email, for example, and and picking the right type of communication for, you know, if it's just a quick question, do you need to email, do you message, do you, you know, what's the right form and medium of communication to, to get what you need out of that? Um, and, you know, the one thing we haven't talked about yet, and usually this is top of the list for Kate and I, is kind of building trust, is that a manager needs to be trusting of the the employee, and the employee has to create that that level of trust. So aligning expectations, you know, letting them know that you are working on things, giving progress updates, you know, again, that's part of that whole, you know, self-management, but you build that that trust where, where people feel like, okay, yeah, you're on top of things and, and all that. And uh, so it definitely is a two-way type of thing in terms of, you know, a manager, you know, feeling they can be be trusting and then the person kind of engendering that 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 level of trust. Well, that uh, that brings up a whole new, uh, a different element. So, uh, sorry, Lucy, you had a, you had a comment. I, I think there's another skill that um, that people are needing to develop as well in this particular working from home period, and that is to to manage all the rest of your networks as well as setting the boundaries for work. One of the things I'm finding, and I'm sure everyone else is the same, is that you know half of the people I know are working from home, and the other half aren't working. And so all day they're kind of ringing up and saying, oh, do you want to come on a Pilates call? And, you know, do you, if you go for a walk, I'm going for a walk at this time and we could wave. And I'm saying like, hey, I'm working. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I am actually working all day. And, you know, there are all these people around in the house that wouldn't normally be there. If I'm working from home normally, that is because it's quiet, I can concentrate, there's nobody around. I would typically be working at home to write papers or articles or something like that. And I'm finding actually there's a lot more disturbance happening. And that's something a lot of people have been saying to me as well, is, you know, my clients are ringing me, I'm picking the phone up and they just want a chat because they're a bit bored. <laughs> so having to manage all of those networks as well and set those boundaries and say to people, I know that lots of people aren't busy, but I still am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's mm -hmm. a skill that people right. need to develop as well. That saying no to people that is that key part of assertiveness that that people so often struggle with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a good point. Uh, but but when you talk about this uh, leadership uh, element that that you touched on, Anita, mm -hmm. um, there's a question here from Johnny Vinken, um, which I sort of goes along those lines. And I think I would point that towards Kate uh, now. When when you're working from home and have a supervisor that is type A, a micromanager, yeah. what can you do to prevent the expectations that you are online 24-7? I think if you have an understanding, um, and probably you as the employee need to start it because if they're they're type A, they're, <laughs> they're, they're managing from their own perspective. Um, normally, if this was a regular program rollout, we would have an agreement, a, a written agreement between us that these are the hours that I expect you to be, to be available. Um, that if you don't, if I email you at three in the morning, it doesn't mean you have to answer at three in the morning. Uh, putting, a, putting up a note when you get in in the morning, hi there, uh, putting up a note at the end of the day, okay, I'm off for the night, uh, and, and be careful not to make the mistake yourself of keeping that conversation going after hours. So, you know, even if I do go back to something and I'm working on it at seven or eight or nine o'clock at night, I often think, well, wait a minute, if I send it now, then that person's going to feel like uh, they need to, to, to answer it now. I'm just going to hold it until tomorrow morning. I mean, sometimes I'll even send it to myself because, you know, then when I come in in the morning, I just look at the things I've sent to myself mm -hmm. so that I remember to to send those out the next day. Uh, so it's kind of a, ma a matter of managing up um, and mm -hmm. you know, setting the boundaries, setting those expectations. 
Anita, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that that a lot of times the other element of that, too, is to, you know, you, you were saying set expectations, which is key, but maybe even set up some regular uh, progress updates. Let's say let's let's meet up, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, whatever, once a week, whatever the, the requirement is and say, OK, we have that time and here's what we'll go over during that. I'll, I'll bring you up to speed. I'll, I'll give you progress. But sometimes having that on a calendar gives just that comfort that, OK, yeah, I'm going to get my update. I don't keep pinging you or whatever. So and 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 that's one of those things that maybe you you talk about up front that, uh, you know, how often do should we do this? And, you know, what, when should it be just so that we can just make sure we're all on the same page. And that's I have, um, so important. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lucy. I had to learn quite a few years ago that because I worked at odd times, it was really unnerving people in my team because I would email them at 11 o'clock at night and then they'd reply and I'd say, you don't need to reply. So I think one of the, um, if we come back to that question about the tools and processes, mm -hmm. is to learn how in Outlook, um, which is the software I use, to delay wow. the sending of an email until a reasonable time. So I will send an email and I'll get it to drop at, eight o'clock in the morning the next day and, that, and that's um that's easy to find now that you're at home and you've got the time to look for it because then it does mean if you're working outside a regular time you can still do your bit of work but it's not stressing other people out yeah. i i have a a great follow-up question here we just received online from chris kane uh, and i think uh, that, that goes to you kate uh, do you think we'll see the end of the monday friday nine to five work week with this? I think we saw the end of that a long time ago. <laughs> uh, you know, people just walk down the street before this and you know, people are, are working on their phones. They're sitting in a doctor's office and they're they're working on their phones. They're having coffee and they're working on their phones. I think what this is going to do is cause us to be intentional about it. You know, not just let it happen, uh, but make it happen. Uh, ha even before we come back, I think companies need to think about how to formalize this. Uh, and, and by doing so, they'll get more out of it. Uh, people will, will have the right protocols and the right processes and the right understandings, and they'll be managing by results. So it's not too late to do some of the things that you, you should have been doing all along. And one of the things I want to want to say in all of this is that almost everything we're talking about here are skills and processes and practices that we all need regardless of whether we're working remotely or whether we're working nine floors away or nine time zones away. It's just become more apparent and, and happened to us more quickly. But th there's nothing that we're talking about in terms of remote tools and technologies and processes and practices that aren't going to help us in business going forward. Um, mm -hmm when we go back to the office. Hi, Chris, by the way. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna, you know, say Kate's so right about that. And I think that we, when we look toward the future, like say we're looking post COVID, I think you're gonna get a combination of more people both in the office and remote. You're gonna get that blend. And that actually layer, that's when these skills become so important because you don't want those remote people to feel remote. You want them to feel like a seamless part of that team. So when you're all remote, it's a little easier, right? We all get on video. We always, you know, put a dial in on on and, and a video on on our meetings and it, because we know everyone's remote. But now when you're sitting in a meeting room and half the people are there, it's almost like you don't want to forget those remote people. You have to have them be an equal part of the team. So all these skills that that we're developing now for remoteness you need to bring them back to the workplace once they once you go back because i i really believe it's going to be a very blended work environment in the future all right time to change subject so this was the uh, the, the section on productivity and especially workplace productivity let's go into the fm profession and this is a question from for you lucy from uh, mike kelly how do you see this impacting the role and the visibility of the facility manager? Do you think this will highlight the importance of cleaning, security, and other FM responsibilities? Well, that's that's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because um, only a few weeks before COVID, 
we were having obviously our wonderful Brexit here in the UK mm -hmm. and that one of the categories of people that had been um, considered, and I mean, this is a government term, low skill, low value people, was anybody earning under, I think, £35,700, which is a lot of money. And that would be way above the salary of any operational cleaner, security guard, catering assistant. So we knew that there was going to be a real issue in our industry in the UK about resourcing some of those posts. Um, in a city like London, about two thirds of those roles are undertaken by people without a UK passport. And right up until COVID, cleaners in particular, they were just considered to be not particularly important. And they are absolutely at the top of the agenda now, because I think people have suddenly realised that, you know, who is cleaning our building? How clean is our building? Who's looking after our building and all our things when we're not there? So actually, I don't want to call it a silver lining because that isn't the right term, but certainly people understand a little bit more now about what FM was for and why it was important and the sorts of things that we were already doing in terms of setting out cleaning schedules and that kind of thing. You know, actually, yes, we do this. Yes, we do that. Yes, we already have the materials, the processes. We already do this for you all the time. So I'm hoping that it really is raising the profile of FM. And certainly there's a real consideration in the UK that FM people are key workers and that they are as important to the running of the hospital, the transport network, um, the infrastructure that needs to keep going as the rest of the people. So what we need to do is to capitalize on that afterwards and make sure that we remain visible. So I think the important moment for FM next after this is to make sure that we're ready when the buildings open up again mm -hmm. and i think this is where uh, facilities managers need to make sure that they are getting on with their reopening plan while they're winding everything down they're looking mm -hmm. at standards like sfg30 about how to kind of mothball their engineering they're thinking about deep cleaning the building and furloughing their staff there's an expectation from the core business in lots of organisations that once they decide that we're going back to work, they can announce that on a Friday and everyone can come in on a Monday. Of course, it's not going to work like that. So while you are working from home, if you are a facilities manager, you need to be planning very carefully what is the ramp up back again so that you can tell your organisation how long it will take from the date they decide they want to reopen to how you will open your building, how you will phase that. Are you going to have enough supplies? Are you going to have enough food to open the canteen? Is everything going to be ready? You need to get back in and sort out your engineering, your fridges. And of course, in the meantime, what compliance work are you doing to keep your building safe during the period where there's nobody there? It's a very busy time for our phones, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. So just. Mm -hmm. Just for everybody to understand, uh, Lucy, you used the word furloughing. I think that's a very British uh, term. I, I'm not sure it's uh, widely accepted around the world. Could you just expand or, or just explain very briefly what that means? Yes, that is a new word for us. Um, although some of us, we knew this word from Orange is the New Black um, because it was on there. But I think um, what we mean by furloughing in the UK is that if your company does not need its staff at the moment instead of laying them off or making them redundant the government will pay 80 percent of their salary if you put them on to this furlough so you right. give them leave to stop working and then they you receive as a business you receive government support to pay those people while you can't employ them during the covid period and I think most countries in Europe uh, have some kind of a furloughing program. I'm not sure that's the same uh, outside uh, Europe uh, at this point in time. But the, yeah, there's a very similar see. program in France. There's a very similar program in Germany. I think yeah. the French and German schemes are a lot more generous than the UK one. And I think the Austrian one is as well. Uh, we understand in the States it's it's a little bit different and there isn't as much support available for companies if they don't need their teams. Kate, you had a comment? 
Yeah, the, I think that when we do go back to the office, FM actually needs to be a lot more visible because people are scared. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they may not want to come back to the office. And to the extent that uh, FM can show them the what they've done to secure the building and to uh, make it a safe environment, I think will help uh, allay those fears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that too. I think that that you need to also just look at, you know, what kinds of spaces are there and what, you, you know, what how people are going to use meeting rooms. You know, a lot of companies have gone to bench seating and, and the types of seating that where, again, you might be right, Kate, they, they don't feel safe, they're too close, there's density levels to address. So there may be, you know, periods of, of you know, how, how do we phase in? What's that going to look like over time? You may not want everyone back at once, for example. And and what is that phase in period? And and what are some contingencies that, um, you know, after people are in, maybe we go through something else in fall or or next winter around this. And and what's that ramp up and ramp down? And um, just so that that's happening in a way where people, you know, feel like they know what's going on and they understand, you know, what the company's doing. I think I but think that, you're right. That, that, that you know where we're used to collaborating in the buildings mm -hmm. you can imagine that when people are going back mm -hmm. they're not going to sit as closely mm -hmm. they're not going to be as comfortable about that but, they're going to but lucy if if you don't mind i'm stopping you because i got mm -hmm. a i got a question from john Kerry on exactly that point what kind of changes to the inside uh, workplace mm -hmm. from the open plan are you seeing mm -hmm. now uh, in the planning and how we move forward sort of to a new world after COVID 19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that for any, Lucy? Any views? Well, yeah, I, I think Lucy was uh, uh, already. I, I, I sort of uh, interrupted her. So if you if you continue along those lines of the question, Lucy, if you don't mind. Well, I think um I think people are going to feel a little bit warier about those kind of shared workplaces and collaborative spaces, and maybe that will just be for a period as we come out of this. You know that kind of feeling you have when you're watching something on TV and you see people at a football match or a pop concert and you feel a bit panicky and you think, oh, they're all so close yeah. together. It might be that people will grow a little bit more feeling that they want personal space around them. And when we were at the Workplace Futures Conference at the beginning of February, um, Craig Knight, Dr. Craig Knight was talking about some of his research about productivity and he had found that actually people were not feeling they were as productive when they were in shared free address space mm -hmm. and that if some of that research was going to start to be um, augmented and that that was going to be a more general finding then perhaps those whole bench seating, free address, hot desking environments might be um, becoming less popular anyway. You can certainly imagine that if there is this, I don't know what we'd call it, hygiene issue, and the idea that um, there would be, in, in some of the countries where they're talking about wristbanding systems of people that have had COVID or are immune and people that aren't, you can imagine that you might not want to share your workspace and you might say, well, I'm fine and I've been vaccinated or I have immunity and I want to stay in my own office and I don't want someone else coming in there and touching all my surfaces. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's interesting because in the when we've designed some uh, flexible situations, there's actually some elements of a flexible workspace where you go into it knowing different people are going to be using this that that may become part of the norm going forward and and a case in point is you know your 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 equipment right the the keyboards and all that that go that's yours it's not necessarily a shared keyboard the phones using voip using you know your cell phone not even having you know a shared phone on that desk um, even for for sustainability reasons we've been seeing more and more workplaces do away with trash bins at the desk I mean, that's another source of, you know, potential germs, et cetera, centralized waste, recycling, you know, for sustainability reasons, we set that up. But you can imagine in, a, in an environment where you're very, you know, kind of germophobic, that's going to be an important element. Um, you know, antimicrobial surfaces, you know, a lot of issues like that, that even if it's a, a sign desk, you know, those kinds of things just, again, limit exposure in a, in a bigger work environment. But I think the big issue... 
We were talking gonna... about this yesterday in, in another call, and I think that perhaps one of the things that we will start to see being incorporated design-wise into some facilities is um, we have a new school at the end of our road, and they have a hand washing area just mm -hmm. before you go into the dining hall. Mm -hmm. And that's separate to the bathrooms. That's just mm -hmm. wash your hands before you eat, wash your hands before yeah. you go into assembly. And yeah. I think that we are probably going to start to perhaps see that in some areas. If you went to a fast food restaurant, for example, at the moment, mm -hmm. you can only wash your hands if you go in and use the bathroom first. And wouldn't it be great in this kind of environment if you could wash your hands and then eat and then they would come and service the tables? I think there will be a lot yeah. more people devoted to servicing of shared spaces in cafes and restaurants and that sort of thing. People are going to expect more than a quick wipe over, aren't they? They're going to want to see Absolutely. that an area is cleaned rather than wiped before Absolutely. a new family arrives. Yeah, I, right. I think that's let's uh, yeah. let's uh, Anita, if you don't mind, I'll stop you because we're half hour half an hour into the uh, session now, and I we have a few polling questions that we would like to ask the audience to uh, to respond to, and if we can get the first poll question up, uh, is your company conducting, sponsoring, or promoting any online remote work training during the crisis? It's a simple yes or no. Uh, and as we see the results take in, Anita, if you if you don't mind sort of sharing a little bit of the um, of the uh, background for, for this, yeah, and, and what you, you know, it, yeah, I think that you know what's interesting is just in seeing all these questions that have come in from the from the first session is there was a lot of questions around you know how do we do this, how do we do that, what skills are important, etc., and it made us think, wow, I, we wonder you know if uh, if if people are doing this because. Uh, right now, there is there are so many online resources. You know, I just was even on on LinkedIn the other day looking at their um, you know certification and 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 all the courses they have on in being an effective remote worker and remote manager and and so there's a lot of resources out there. So you know, for the 58 percent of you, um, you know that's great, and I think that um, that there are resources for the people where the company hasn't sponsored it yet. Um, it sounds like they may have been caught a little more off guard maybe, but there are so many resources online. And there, you know, that's the kind of thing that that if you're taking a break or whatever, there's there's podcasts, there's there's classes, there's even, you know, as I was saying, kind of this, uh, the, the certification where you go through a series of courses and, you know, you're certified to be a good remote worker. So um, I, I think that, that that's the kind of thing that um, it, it's going to service you well in in your career even post COVID. So if it's the kind of thing you haven't been uh, that that the company hasn't sponsored, it's still something that you can take on. And and let's stay with that theme and get the next polling question up. Have you received any training on working remotely? Um, and there are three uh, three answers to this. You can see uh, mm -hmm. um, on on the poll. Uh, Kate, um, same to you really. I mean. What is the what is the importance of this training? I guess we all need to understand how we do this effectively. But what what what's sort of available and what should companies do in this area? Yeah, I, I said earlier about being intentional, making the, the program formal. This is the kind of thing that uh, if we were advising a company, uh, or you know, Anita in, in her work. You roll out over six months or a year or even more, and boom, we had to do it overnight. And during that six months, there's all kinds of training about how do you manage remote workers, how do you how do you uh, set expectations, all the kinds of questions that we're answering right now, really should have been answered before everybody went out remotely. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that 31% uh, saw the did have training before this. Mm -hmm. um, and that companies are stepping up to the plate and, and saying, you know, we we have to do this now. For those that haven't received uh, remote training, that 43%, I, I, I think they will before this is over. A lot of the last couple of weeks, uh, last month has been just surviving. Um, um, yeah. So I think it will. And, and, and what kind of, I mean, what kind of training? Because it's not only using the technology in the right way, it's also mm -hmm. conducting yourself and making sure that, you know, whatever you do, remotely and when you do meetings like this um, and, and webinars and mm -hmm. you know uh, online meetings that that you do then in the most effective and uh, you know efficient way 
Brian? We would have practiced it with the tools. Uh, we, we wouldn't be having these questions of how do I manage expectations? What do I do with a micromanaging boss? Uh, would I be working after hours? I'm not sure I mentioned last time, uh, GitLab, G-I-T-L-A-B, has their entire employee manual uh, available open source. Uh, and they're a thousand person all remote company. There's two chapters, one on remote work and one on communications that, that are just brilliant. I mean, it goes through all of the things that, that answers to all of the things we've been talking about yeah. now. When do you use email? Well, when do what you was that reference again? Sorry. GitLab, G-I-T-L-A-B. They probably hate me because okay. I've said <laughs> that. <laughs> they're going crazy. <laughs> uh, but they're one of the largest all remote companies and they just, They've covered everything in that manner. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we've got policies, mm -hmm. yeah. sample policies on our site. Mm -hmm. Just do a search for sample policies, sample yeah. training. Uh, uh, the but, U.S. Yeah. government has their training available free. Uh, so uh, you, you've got a head start here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And let's jump to the last polling question, um, and and I'll I'll direct that to you, Lucy. What impact do you think COVID will have on office space in the future? Um, less space, the same amount, no significant change. Um, and while, while people are punching in their, their answers, uh, we could probably also combine this a little bit about some of the questions we have received about you know, the facility management function of the future. So if, if you don't mind sort of elaborating a little bit on what you see the office space of the future, but also what you see the role of FM uh, developing in the future once we get the answers in. Oh, as we this get is, the answer. This is Peter, a great a question. question. Um, to be I, I think that the um, it's likely that people will all move to working from home much more than they did before now that they know how to do it. So the impact on space is mm. going to be fascinating, isn't it? I think that overall, it's probably right to say that less space will be needed for the areas that we think of as the traditional office. But what is likely to happen is that collaboration space will change and will increase. One of the things we're all learning is how much we're missing collaboration now that we're not able to do it. And that's partly to do with face-to-face -face contact. We can do that a little bit through interfaces like video conferencing, but getting around the table together, brainstorming, you know, having a sandwich together while you're talking through ideas, the sorts of things that none of us can do at the moment, perhaps aren't always as facilitated as they might be in some of the workplaces. So I think we're going to see a very different use of space within the footprint. It might mean a reduction in quiet, lone working, because that is something that now we know we can do somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's also going to have an impact on the design of people's homes and locally to where people live too, isn't it? I have quite a few meetings now in places, terrible places like motorway service stations, and it would be great for there to be a better place to meet halfway in a small country like the UK that wasn't just a coffee bar. So perhaps we will see more of those sorts of facilities as well. Thanks. Kate, you had a follow up comment? Yeah, something we've already been seeing, particularly for the companies that have been remote or partially remote for some time, uh, is that they're they're actually trying to make their places, their, their spaces, a place people want to come. Uh, so, you know, and, and turning them into social spaces and collaborative spaces, as you said, Lucy. Um, but, but that whole benching and, you know, I don't want to go there mm -hmm. and there's disease and all of that, I think we're going to see a transformation of uh, and an understanding that if you want your people to come in, you, you're going to have to make us, you know, some, you're going to have to give us something that we should yeah. come in for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the um, I think that also just the issue of, you know, elevators are going to be issues and, and, you know, versus stairs, maybe making, you know, we've been seeing that increase in, in those kinds of, uh, you know, wayfinding. And I think collaborative spaces may take a turn in terms of what kinds of, you know, is it these little closed, you know, privacy rooms where you squeeze four people in versus having more open, um, you know, segmented 
uh, spaces too. So I think I agree completely with Lucy though about that private work, that that you know concentrated focus work can be done at home. And so when you come in, you're coming in for a very different reason. And and making and, and I think the nature of those spaces may change a bit though going forward um, in, in terms of just the closure and and sizes. But I would add I would add to that that it's probably mm -hmm. not only the spaces that would be changed. I think also the amenities and also the mm -hmm. services. Yeah. Because yeah. I think we'll see that all of a sudden people don't just come in to work to work. But they mm -hmm. come in to be social, to network, yeah. to collaborate, to have meetings, to mm -hmm. eat a great lunch, to have a great mm -hmm. cup of coffee, uh, and those types of things. So I think that that this will drive a change in the workplace as we know it from from yeah. all aspects probably. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, uh, another question on um, on engagement <clears throat> as a distributed, and that's for Renuka uh, Rajak Opal uh, last week. As distributed workforce programs becomes reality, how is employee engagement and cost culture sustained and productivity measured? Uh, Anita, I know this is your field of work also. Okay, well, I, I always love that productivity question, you know, and, and, I, and I always say, so how did you measure productivity before this? If you measured it by looking and seeing who was sitting in a seat and walking around, that was the wrong way to measure productivity. Um, you know, so, you know, essentially what makes you productive shouldn't have changed before to now. You know, it's just, you know, a manager understanding how to manage remotely, right? Setting those expectations, you know, keeping in touch with people, you know, measuring progress, giving feedback, and all those same kinds of things apply. Um, but but it, it really shouldn't be FaceTime. It should be, you know, what what's being delivered. And again, between the person and the manager, just letting, you know, keeping the manager appraised of what's getting done and the manager feeling like, you know, that's meeting my expectations. But I think that, um, but I, I think the other element of, of how do you keep people engaged, it's, it's really um, a lot of those skills we've been talking about and, and, and taking what we used to do, you know, in person and making that virtual, having, you know, virtual, you know, uh, happy hours, having virtual coffee breaks. You know, we've been seeing more kind of just virtual, you know, wellness where, where people, you know, have a cup of tea and just, you know, are there chatting. Um, but I think the video element's really important and, and, and hearing from leaders is really important, especially during this time when people are very apprehensive about things. Um, you know, so, so the whole idea of leadership briefings, virtual socials, you know, taking a lot of what creates a sense of community and, and doing that in a more remote way. And I, I think that as, again, post COVID, I think you're going to get people coming in and out more. And um, so you always will have some element, I think, of your workforce, not there physically present, but, but maybe remote. So creating the kinds of communications and engagement activities that don't forget that people are remote, that, that, that don't forget that, that not everyone's here physically present, I think is going to be, you know, really important as a long-term strategy. Kate, before uh, you jump in, because mm -hmm. we are we are getting mm -hmm. um, a little bit time pressured here, or or actually not a little bit, <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> uh, but uh, if I can just end up with one one question, uh, we just got that from uh, Jiri Prasad Fama Um These cultural shifts that you're talking about, Anita, um, is certainly going to shift the way we manage facilities. But how should they, the facility manager, cope with these in this change and flux we are in, both strategically, culturally, and I also with all the COVID-19 stuff. Yeah, uh, Kate, I mean, okay, Kate. Sorry, no, uh, Kate, if you don't mind. Uh, actually, uh, I, I'd rather hear from Lucy or Anita okay. on this. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Fair enough. And Anita, you were, you were just saying. Okay, I, mean, I was gonna say, you know, we look at look at scenarios. I mean, I mean, we do, we do a lot of scenario planning, strategic planning look at alternative options. I mean, there can be different, it's hard for us to predict right now what's going to happen this summer, you know, when people are going to be going back to work, you know, what is going to happen next winter. Have contingency plans is, is probably one of the best things you could be doing right now because how you will respond to those might vary and having those in advance thought through, it's going to just make you a little bit more prepared, you know, for, you know, the inevitable you know, questions and, and uh, unforeseen events that are that are probably ahead of us. And Lucy, I think it comes back to that issue about the ramping up again. 
Mm -hmm. I think that the scenarios that people are going to need to work up for coming out of COVID yeah. are going to be very slow start, kind of moderate start, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pretty sudden back to normal. Yeah. And until we, we haven't seen any countries apart from China come back online yet. Yeah. And we don't know enough about what's really happening in organizations in China. So I think until we see um organizations similar to our own coming back on stream all we can do is scenario plan because nobody quite knows how it's going to work exactly mm -hmm. yeah all right um help us to learn from all this uh what we call the global work from home experience uh, we have a, a work uh, from home experience survey that is managed by the workplace evolutionaries community um you can see that online and, and hopefully you will help us to provide some of the answers to this. All the results uh, are shared openly. So all the, the feedback from the survey, you can, you'll be able to see once it's, it's, it's finished uh, and you'll be able to download that and work with the data uh, in your own uh, premises. Also join us again next Wednesday as we continue the IFMA COVID-19 series. Uh, the next webinar will be on lessons learned from Asia. Uh, but also mm -hmm. next week, we have the Global Facility Fusion online event, which includes several webinars, including the next we webinar from the Workplace Evolutionaries on moving towards the new normal after the global work from home experience. That also circles around some of the questions that we, um, that we pose in the survey. So watch this space as we, uh, as we uh, carry on um, um, over the next couple of uh, weeks and months. Let's see how long the COVID-19 outbreak will, will last. Will last. With this, I would once again like to say thank you to all the participants for your questions and inputs, both from those last week, but also the ones we've see, received today. And then a big thank to all our three, or to our three panelists for <laughs> your inputs and answer and expertise advice. Please follow IFMA and the WE community online for more information on this topic uh, and also other related topic on an ongoing basis. And I would recommend you to visit the IFMA Coronavirus Responsiveness Resource Center at ifma.org or the We E Global Work From Home survey, as we mentioned before. Thank you all for your time today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay home. See you all next week.